This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Now, um, you all are going to have exactly the same feeling that a lot of other people have said when they asked, what in the world is the astro an astrophysicist doing chairing a session on oceanography? <laughs> and the answer is um, that Wolf Berger, who was scheduled to do this, was unable to make it. So we self-organized at the last minute, and I'm your chairman which is why I'm here, and that's the only logical explanation I can offer. So, uh, and then uh, at the la and so we have a self-organized session, and the only thing I know is the order of the speakers, and I know two of their three topics. Um, Walter Monk, who will go first, I asked him what he was going to say, and he said it's a secret. <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, he's earned the privilege. And uh, so then next is John Orkut, with whom I worked exceptionally closely when uh, he and I were in the director's office together. And he's going to talk about the Arctic, which will be a nice lead in to one of the talks uh, that we will have in my session uh, next uh, to tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's coming up. Uh, I, I think my talk is prepared. I'm not sure, but I... And then, finally, Lynn Talley uh, is going to talk about uh, ocean circulation and the, and the real topic of this uh, session, which is the oceans. So with that, Walter, I'm as uh, eager to hear what uh, this classified topic is uh, as, uh, as everybody else. You will soon see why I wouldn't reply to Charlie. You see, here's my first slide, and everyone else so far has started by complimenting Charlie what a great job he did in various aspects. My first slide was stolen from Charlie from something he spoke about a few months ago at the Vatican. That is a slide that Charlie showed on his most recent work on the hiatus of global warming. And you see there are two periods, one around starting around 1960 and another one starting very recently, about 20 or 5 or so, where the temperature of the atmosphere and of the surface water did not change at a time when the CO2 content of the atmosphere was continuing its unstoppable continuous increase that it has done since the turn of the century. And people who would like to find a fault with the global warming point of view could point to that and say, you see, there, are the, there has been no warming for 10 years and CO2 has gone up. What's going on? And. Uh, Charlie has written a very detailed paper on that subject, which is being published by the, by the Vatican, the American, American Philosophical Society, and has <coughs> related that to an El Nino, La Nina cycle, having looked into many possibilities. And I want to point out that I think he's absolutely right. And I will show you slide two, which I was permitted to show by uh, courtesy of Dean Rummick and John Church from Australia. Uh, and it goes back to something that was discussed earlier this morning, arco floats. You know there are now 35, 3,600 Argo floats. You've seen a few pictures of how they're distributed over the world's ocean. They go down to 
2,000 meters and then stay there for 10 days, then go up to the surface and give the information of what they measure on the way down and on the way up to some satellites. A hugely successful undertaking. And this is a unpublished slide of what they have observed to 2,000 meters. And it shows that in that deeper column, the heat content, which is the proper variable, not the surface temperature, but the heat content, has in fact increased over this period, even though surface temperature, as you can see, remained relatively constant. And it looks on that slide as if this year will in fact be the end of constant surface temperatures as well. And it's in complete support that there is a warming of the heat content of the planet Earth. And the interesting thing is that it is now going deeper to 2,000 meters. And the reason for it going deeper has to do, in fact, with the El Nino-La Nina circulation, which Charlie discussed. Please let me discuss a table which I think is very interesting based on, 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 on the, the Dean Ramek's data. On the left column are heat content uh, at various depths. In joule, and the change, I'm sorry, change in heat content in joules per year. And in the last 10 years, from 0 to 500 meters, 3 times 10 to the 21st, and almost the same amount from 500 to 2,000 meters. That's an enormous change, isn't it, Charlie, in the point of view that people have taken. You cannot interpret the unbalance in radiation without looking at not only at the surface layer of the ocean, but you have to now go down to 2,000 meters. And maybe even essentially, we have to go deeper. And those numbers are very encouraging. Six times 10 to the 21st joules per year, when you ask what it demands for the unbalance, you get roughly 0.55 watts per meter square, which is a very respectable number in terms of what we know. It corresponds to certain numbers of degrees per year. And uh, if you calculate the total thermal expansion for the whole water column, 0 to 2,000 meters, using the Argo data, you come out with 3 millimeters per year as the contribution to global sea level rise from thermal expansion. It's not the major component of sea level rise, but it's a very significant amount. There is a further amount from the melting of land-based glaciers, which is not contained. And I was surprised at the magnitude. Now, if you look to the right, it has an equally interesting and unsuspected conclusion. Uh, it looks at the distribution, not with depth, but with latitude of that increase in the ocean's heat content. And almost all of it is in the southern hemisphere. I don't think that was anticipated by anybody. Did you know that that would come out that way, Charlie? With Argo data. Oh, I'm sorry. I, saw, I thought I would show it for the first time <laughs> with Dean Ramick's thing. <laughs> so that is a really a, a basic step forward in understanding global warming. And it does support, in fact, the theory that people have had. Now, I have been an advocate of using acoustics as a way of measuring 
large-scale warming. And I have to tell you a few things about this particular method. It has turned out that low-frequency acoustics is remarkably well propagated in the ocean because of the existence of a waveguide, typically at one kilometer. A minimum in wave in, in, in the speed of sound, the speed of sound increases upwards because it gets warmer and downwards because the pressure increases. And uh, in 1960, Morris Ewing, who had discovered this sound channel, in fact, had his brother work, working near Perth, Australia, on a geophysical experiment and he was looking at the map of, of the Earth and called up his brother John and said, looks to me like I ought to be able to hear you. Why don't you boys drop a few sticks of dynamite in the water and let me see whether I can pick them up in Bermuda three and a half hours later. And they did drop 200 pounds of sticks of dynamite three times. There were no inhibitions at the time. It was a better time. <laughs> and three and a half hours later, this is what uh, Maurice Ewing observed. In each case, there were two arrivals, and they were clearly received in Bermuda three and a half, three and a half hours later. And it turned out nobody published that result for years. And then I got a hold of the data and published it and explained why there were two pulses each time and gave the wrong theory. I said it was because there'd be a reflection from Bermuda, which would give a second arrival a few, few, few seconds later. It turns out that the real answer for the dual arrival is shown really by the great circles in the lower figure. Notice that between Perth and Bermuda, you can draw some great circle routes. One collides with the Cape of Good Hope, but just seems to barely go by, not very well. The other one to the left collides with Brazil, and somehow or another we had to figure that sound had a way to get through. I've mentioned nothing about Kerguelen, which gets in the way as well. And so nothing was published, and we, as I will show in the next slide, uh, based a future experiment on that. Now, in recent days, a former Scripps student, Brian Dushaw, has studied this in great detail, and he used what is now available five-day ocean temperature salinity charts that from which you can compute the sound speed and allow for refraction. And he found that over a period of a month, sometimes the rays that are drawn here would go, would wiggle back and forth through that narrow window. Sometimes they would miss the Cape of Good Hope and get through. At other times, they would miss Brazil and get through. But they got through only a few days a month. And could it be that, that Morris Ewing, who was incredibly lucky, had just picked a few days a month <laughs> when the refraction was suitable? And we still do not understand why, what really is going on. It's an interesting experiment. Uh, the real explanation for the dual arrival is that the ray near the northern ray comes in a little sooner and by the right amount than the southern ray. In some ways, you have apparently two arrivals, a Cape of Good Hope arrival and a Brazil arrival. Uh, <clears throat> now, the advantage, what this suggests is that a repeat of this experiment could give you a one-figure number about global warming. Global because it's halfway around the Earth. And from a time point of view, it's 50 years. So it's through most of the uh, Industrial Revolution. 
And the difference in travel time is 10 seconds. It would today come in 10 seconds earlier because the ocean has gotten warmer. And it would be such an easy experiment and it would perhaps convince some people. And in a way, I like it as compared to the Argo floats because it is integrating by its very nature. A single number has integrated over the path from Perth to, to Bermuda. Whereas with the Argo floats, what they do is to average each month all Argo floats within a degree square. And so on different months, you have different instruments in that area. And it's, I find it a little more satisfactory to use an integrating measure like the travel time as compared to averaging random floats in the area. Now, encouraged by that experiment, we performed a little later the Heard Island experiment. We used a, a, a loudspeaker, an electric source that was furnished to us by the Navy, went to the Heard Island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and it turns out that from that location, you actually have great circle routes into the Atlantic via the Cape of Good Hope in Brazil, into the Indian Ocean, of course, and into the Pacific Ocean, especially by a window between New Zealand and Antarctica. And we managed by, without any bureaucracy, to persuade 12 colleagues around the world to go into take their ships out and lower a hydrophone into the sound channel and listen to us starting our, uh, our uh, transmission on Australia Day. Uh, we had great difficulties because uh, it turned out at the time that various uh, marine biological groups opposed it for f illegitimate fear that the intensity of the sound would be harmful to marine mammals, to whales. And we were asked to take two ships, one to observe the marine mammals in the area, another one to have the hydrophone and have the acoustic loudspeakers that we used. And we had the obligation, reasonably enough, that if the biologic observers would find any indication of marine mammal discomfort that we would have to cease our experiment, and there were no such indications. And um, so from one point there, we could uh, really start observing all the oceans. And uh, we have drawn sort of speculative plans to uh, make a deep sea network of sources and receivers. You need only a one to do 12, one or two dozens to really get good averages for all of the ocean basins of the world. And I'm still hoping years, years later that we could persuade the authorities to permit that. It would be a nice augmentation of the Argo floats to have the two methods of and I think it's going to be essential in the next 30 years to measure the heat content of the oceans. Well, people will get worried about climate change, and they will want to know where the heat is going. And I'm hoping this will be possible. Thank you. <clears throat> Just add that there will soon soon be a conference on uh, on this whole method and redeploying the this uh, uh, acoustic measurement of thermal content. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I, I should I forgot to add that there is one problem: the Ewing experiment did not do good navigation, and there is a difficulty in re-establishing the exact positions where the dynamites were dropped. <laughs>
However, you could do the Heard Island experiment over again, and there is some, there are some thoughts of doing that. Thank you. It's uh, I'm John Orchid. I uh, just introduced. Uh, I uh, have been uh, well. I began my work career as a nuclear submariner in the in the Navy and left submarining as a commander uh, in the USN in 1972 and came to Scripps to do a PhD, which I completed in 76. Um, and my subject was marine or ocean seismology in particular, and uh, the structure and dynamics of the long volcano that represents the uh, mid-ocean ridge was the subject of my work, and some of the th fun things that I got to do was submarining again, for example, with my partner Bob Ballard uh, and discovered uh, at uh, 21 North in the uh, East Pacific Rise this idea, this uh, fact of uh, black smokers, very high temperature vents in the seafloor, uh, and so on. And then subsequent to that, got involved a lot with the uh, uh, monitoring and uh, verification of uh, test ban treaties. In fact, uh, uh, fairly early when I was director of uh, IGPP, we, we had a, a, a substantial program with the uh, Soviet Union developing uh, confidence, measure, uh, confidence, confidence building measures associated with how large nuclear tests actually were in uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, then perestroika happened. Um, and the world changed a great deal, uh, but still, uh, the institution does continue to operate about a third of the global seismic network uh, around the planet, which is kind of an unusual thing for a university to do, but we do. These long-term measurements uh, have become pretty critical. I was the third director of the Institute of Geophysics, Cecil and Ida Green, Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. Uh, Walter was first, Freeman Gilbert, followed and I was the third director for quite a long time uh, here. When Charlie came, uh, he asked if I would be interested in, in being his deputy. And, and uh, since I knew where all the skeleton closets were at IGVP, I thought I'd find out where they were around scripts. And for better or for worse, I'd probably learned all that too. Uh, it was a very interesting experience. Uh, we had a lot of things to do and uh, lots of opportunities. Um, the, uh, uh, those were back in the days when uh, we had a budget in Congress, and we actually knew what the budget might be from year to year, and that there might actually be changes. But So in that sense, all those years of, uh, of uh, working uh, with uh, some uh, level of management here, we had new opportunities almost all the time. And we, things have changed. We've uh, we have more limitations today than we did uh, even three or four years ago, but there are also still some great uh, new opportunities. Uh, one of the things I just began to do is I starting a new journal in the AGU, uh, which is named after, it appears, uh, the department at UCLA, uh, Earth and Space Sciences, but the goal of the thing is actually to uh, provide a venue in which people can publish uh, papers on, on uh, things having to do with Earth and space systems, but also concentrate on the background, that is, the things that uh, um, Jeff Dozier talked about, these ideas of how do you actually get from measurements that are made on a platform to things that with which you do science, that is, uh, how do you understand the instruments that you're using, how do you understand the processing that goes into a problem, uh, even what's the code used and what is the advantage. So it's a rather new departure here, but we in Earth Sciences, I think, for and Ocean Sciences for decades have not had a particularly good reward system for those who spend time working on the uh, nitty-gritty of how do you make a measurement, how do you build an instrument, how do you uh, actually reduce the data that are, the raw data that uh, arrive uh, here. So I hope, uh, those of you in the audience uh, that uh, uh, are here and have uh, have interest in publishing such things will get in touch, and uh, we can uh, uh, we have started uh, accepting papers on the first of August, and I have about five of them in uh, process now. So I hope that the uh, the journal will become popular in the earth sciences and the AGU.
Um, Lou, I think, uh, Lanzarotti earlier uh, commented on the, uh, um, the uh, spatial and temporal uh, uh, inadequacies of modeling, and they're problematic. Uh, the skill of climate models in predicting 10 or a decade or 20 years into the future are particularly limited. And so the talk that I'm going to give is going to be uh, pretty relentlessly observational here. And just to acquaint you with the, uh, the Arctic, this is some of the names. Uh, the Karen Loptev Seas uh, are important in this. Uh, the Beaufort Sea off Alaska is important. Uh, and, uh, but you don't have to memorize, and there won't be any kind of a quiz uh, associated with this. Um, so this just shows you what the Arctic looks like. But uh, the sea, uh, the, the ice is changing uh, substantially uh, uh, with time. And this just gives you an idea from 83 to uh, 2011, um, uh, the, particularly the, the, uh, the graph, which is on the, uh, the bottom here. These are uh, graphs through time of uh, five-year-old ice, four, three, two, and one-year-old ice. And you can see that relentlessly that the, uh, the, uh, the old ice is uh, disappearing and moving, uh, moving out of the Arctic every year. And the size of the one-year ice has been substantially increasing. So it's becoming a smoother, younger, ice-covered ocean. But Walter brought up the issue of how do we measure the heat content in this environment. It's very difficult with uh, substantial ice cover to use, uh, uh, to use the Argo floats. Uh, and he proposed, of course, uh, not surprisingly, that uh, we should think about uh, the acoustic approach to doing this. This is another picture of what's been going on with sea ice, that uh, graph at the top uh, with the, uh, the black line here is an average over 1981 to 2010. And uh, this is two plus or minus two standard deviations of the, uh, of the curve. In uh, 2012, uh, the ice cover in the, uh, in the uh, Arctic uh, reached its large, or smallest known minimum, largest known minimum uh, in that year. And hasn't, uh, we haven't seen that since. Um, this is uh, a couple of days ago, what the ice cover looks like now. And you can see it's well above the ice cover uh, that uh, was present uh, t two years ago. So uh, we don't know what next year will be like, but certainly uh, we've departed from what might have been thought to be normal uh, in the past. Uh, this just shows you, again, the ice extent uh, in uh, a few days ago here, as well as the, uh, the mean ice coverage for this time of year, median ice coverage this time of year, averaged over the period 1981 to 2010. But the picture that you get uh, is uh, quite clearly changing. And one way to uh, really get a feel for this, these slides that I'm going to show you came from Larry Mayer. Uh, he's a scientist at uh, University of New Hampshire. Uh, he's a student of Scripps, but his profession now is uh, the uh, details of uh, the seafloor, ocean, sea, uh, the deep seafloor, uh, multi uh, beam mapping at uh, very high resolutions. And he has been, for the last several years, working on acquiring data during the summertime in the, uh, in the Arctic. And so this is a picture of the, uh, the bow of their uh, ship. Uh, heading into the ice in uh, uh, 2007 at uh, about uh, 20 degrees uh, south of the, uh, the pole. So this was um, some time ago in 2007, not that long ago, only seven years. And if we take a look uh, in 2012, that spectacular year that I showed you earlier, this is precisely the same spot, different ship. Uh, but there is absolutely no ice cover in this thing. If we go uh, about 60 kilometers to the north, uh, this is what it looked like um, in uh, 2007. Uh, here again, uh, ice covered. Um, and if we go uh, look at it, uh, 
in 2012 that's an open ocean. So this uh, is just a graphic, it's a, it's a mariner's view of what it means to have no ice cover, uh, but it's bringing a ship to these things to understand it. The goal he has, of course, is to map as much of the um, offshore uh, topography as is possible during these periods of time, and he collaborates with the Canadians who actually have an operating icebreaker to uh, collect these data. He follows the, uh, with, uh, the ship with the multi beam, he follows the icebreaker. During this period of time, at this point, he's, he has uh, measured about 40% of the American and Canadian, North American ocean up to the North Pole. So our proposal uh, that a number of us are working on at the moment is a cable uh, which would uh, move, uh, go from Barrow through the North Pole to uh, Long Yerbin, where our Canadian colleagues uh, have a number of stations, plus very, very good internet connections uh, and cabling into Long Yerbin. Uh, Barrow is more complex. There's a uh, because the ocean uh, retreat or the ice retreats so much every year now, the erosion along that coastline is tremendous, and uh, getting a cable ashore and keeping it there for decades is not trivial uh, from the point of engineering. But we're proposing this particular experiment uh, over a very long period of time. This is just a fanciful cartoon of a cable uh, with a repeater uh, which happens every 75 to 100 kilometers in this thing that has capability with communicate, for communicating with uh, systems that are outside uh, through acoustics or um, blue-green laser or blue-green light uh, to operate a variety of different experiments. This uh, thing that I show you here is a, is a uh, transponder uh, that is... Uh, is meant to represent the, uh, the system that Walter talked about. The actual source, the actual transducer itself is not remotely as attractive as that, um, but it's a good artist uh, perception of the, uh, the idea. There are a number of uh, potential uh, sensors on the seafloor and these uh, systems uh, here, here, and here are actually used uh, with the tomographic experiment to measure the position of that transponder uh, accurately on the, in the uh, water column. You have to know the position of that transponder to approximately a meter in order to measure a average mil uh, uh, temperature change of a milli-degree over several hundred, several thousand kilometers, the kind of source receiver distances. But all those different systems that would be on the seafloor in the Arctic uh, using this approach would support not just the thermometry or the uh, uh, um, tomography at these sites, but they would also be able to support regular normal uh, oceanographic observations and gliders, for example, that could be used to actually profile physically in the, Atl in the uh, Arctic without coming to the surface, where, which is largely generally occupied by ice. The people up here, some of the people that are involved in this, uh, uh, Hane Sagan is, uh, is in uh, Norway, and uh, we've discussed this with the, uh, the foundation, that Science Foundation in Norway, and they're interested in being partners. Uh, Art Bagger, Peter Mikulewski, uh, Peter Wooster have done a lot of work in the Arctic. Peter, in fact, now is in uh, north of uh, Tromso putting in a three-year Navy experiment to do thermometry in the Arctic to repeat some work that Peter Mikulewski did years ago. So heat content can be measured this way. It's a geophysical approach uh, to doing this. Walters explained it somewhat. But in a, in, uh, certainly in uh, seismology, tomography, looking at the aspherical variations in the Earth is a very common tool. Uh, Carl Wunsch has told me twice now that uh, he thinks that tomography um, is too complicated for physical oceanographers. They can't really deal with the complexity of this, but I don't believe that's actually quite true. But this is what Carl keeps insisting to me, that it's too complicated. I think it's not. Anyway, that's a proposal. Uh, we're working on it, and I think it's critical as the Arctic changes so much over the next uh, several decades 
that this Arctic watch be put in place and the, the kinds of oceanographic sensors that we can use to measure what the satellites cannot measure are critical to our future. Thanks. Thanks so much, Charlie and Ellen, for inviting me to come. Um, uh, there was a charge to talk about where do we come from, where, what are we, and where are we going? I think that comes from Gauguin. And there's actually a song or a round I could lead you in, but we won't. <laughs> where I'm coming from is following Walter and John, which is a pretty heavy duty thing. And where we're standing is here, and where we're going is to dinner. So I'll try, <laughs> try, try not to. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm a physical oceanographer. I've been here 30 years, wow. Um, and um, what I do will become evident, I think, as we go through here. Um, so I will move on. I'm gonna just tell you what the final messages will be because I have, as usual, too many slides. Number one, um, as you've already seen, global warming is ocean warming. And we will show you the numbers from that. Uh, number two, so that's gonna be probably my, that'll be my last topic. But I think it's the most important message. Uh, second um, is um, I was asked to talk about what I thought was interesting to me over 30 years. And I'm a very large scale oceanographer. Um, and so um, the global scale of the ocean circulation is what's been interesting me. And there's been an awful lot of work on that um, over the last uh, 30 years. Um, especially, I'm going to move from the Arctic down to the Southern Ocean here, uh, the area which is around, we call the Southern Ocean is around Antarctica. Um, it's critical to this global scale circulation. Um, and that region affects the Earth's climate. It affects the sea level uh, through its changes, uh, its effects on the ice sheet at um, Antarctica and on carbon balances and on productivity of the ocean. I won't go through all of those things, but I just want to make the point that the Southern Ocean, which is really far away and usually not in our minds, um, is, is extremely important for um, our Earth's climate. And it's already been alluded to. Charlie already mentioned it. Uh, that the paper that came out six days ago shows where th this amount of heat uh, in the Southern Ocean. Um, and lastly, I'm an observer. Um, I want to make sure we say, as John has just said and Walter said, sustained observations are key for monitoring and understanding how the climate is changing. Um, it's important to keep the innovation going. A sustained doesn't mean static. Um, and uh, especially important to keep moving towards even more autonomous instrumentation. Argo is great. Let's build on it. Um, and areas that are tremendously undersampled that are important for this climate question are the deep ocean and the southern ocean. So that's basically where I'll end at the end. Um, I would just want to talk a little bit about where I came from. Uh, <laughs> um, there was, because uh, I want to tie this into space. This is pretty much it. Uh, but back in 1957, there was the IGY. Um, and there was uh, this Sputnik. And that's all that most of us in that, who were children then, knew about IGY. Um, but that started a real explosion in science education in the US. And I think that that made a huge difference for our generation coming along in the 60s and 70s in grade school and so forth. Education matters. Um, and the education uh, was irrespective of a gender. And so uh, girls got treated like boys, at least in my school. And, um, and the space race was on. So off we went. That's pretty much it. Um, there I am. <laughs> I didn't want to work on astrophysics because it's, um, it's my dad's interest, um, uh, but I like to get my hands dirty. So there we are, um, <laughs> building dams in the stream. Um, the other thing that was really important, I think, for our generation of women, and I'm, you know, I'm at the end of my career now, um, was that uh, there was a feminist movement, a women's equality movement in the 70s, before it got a bad name. Um, and it was important that we learned that we can do it and that we did, weren't discouraged from uh, following what we wanted to do until I got on my first cruise on a Woods Hole ship in 1978 and my second cruise on a Scripps ship in 1984. But that was long after I'd chosen to be an oceanographer. So, <laughs> and things have really improved on the ships. The other thing that was important in the IGY, um, which I only learned much later, uh, pretty much after getting here, was how important it figured in ocean science. And there's Roger Revelle, who was the chair of the panel on oceanography um, of the US IGY committee that year. And that started the big carbon um, measurements. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that tomorrow. And there's Dave Keeling, um, hired uh, basically then to, to head the atmospheric CO2 program. Uh, so that started um, a lot of involvement in Scripps. And then I had one more legacy thing. Um, Scripps has a legacy of female physical oceanographers um, that goes back longer than Woods Hole. Um, uh, Margaret Robinson and uh, June Petullo was the first um, female PhD 
um, in, in physical oceanography from Scripps. And uh, there was sort of a trickle of women along through there, and uh, then the floodgates opened. Terry Cheresk and I were the first, uh, were two that arrived uh, at Woods Hole together. Terry is here, uh, working here. And Nan Bray was just two years ahead of us, and she worked here for quite a while. And Nan was the first PhD from Woods Hole. So from there, uh, moving on here, I would say it all came together, space, oceanography, uh, women's rights, <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and science education um, in the um, christening of the Sally Ride just a couple weeks ago um, up in Anacortes. So I think here we are. So that's kind of where things came from. Um, what do I do as an oceanographer? Um, I work on really large scales. There's the Palmer. This is an icebreaker that was in Hobart. This was last uh, winter, uh, actually summer there. Um, and um, I am a co-chair of the US program that operates a global scale um, uh, repeat survey. We did a lot of um, surveying of the oceans along all of these lines and many more in the 1990s in something called the World Ocean Circulation Experiment. And we have been continuing to do this, uh, these measurements along select lines. And this is the network that's currently done. The red lines are the US lines. And that black line in the middle right there is uh, a section I was on in um, March. Um, what do we do on this? Um, these are the gold standard of measurements. These are still ship-based measurements. We go out, we make the highest accuracy. It's really important to have a big network of things like Argo floats, but you still need something to calibrate and uh, judge everything by, and you can't measure all the chemistry that's necessary for understanding climate change. So this is a network for doing that. Top to bottom, highest standards. Um, and so here went our, our crews uh, last March coming out of Hobart, off to the left, zooming uh, south of the uh, New Zealand EEZ, down to a point in the Ross Sea, and then we zoom north to Tahiti. Um, I'm showing an altimetry image, actually. This is showing, um, we heard about altimetry um, a lot already. Um, this is a big eddy field. Um, it's not the actual circulation, it's the eddy part of the circulation. Um, it's very vigorous in here. This is the Antarctic Circumpolar com Current coming through here, eddying lots of noise. That's the last noise I'll show you. I work on large-scale things that are pretty smooth. Um, but every time we look at our data sets, we have to be aware of this very vigorous field, and it shows us how strong the currents are. The currents are very unstable through here. Uh, we measured from the Ross Sea north. Um, this is the group. This is our, our measurement equipment. Uh, there's a few people sampling. Mark Warner, who was Ray Weiss's student here, he's been doing CFCs um, and uh, collection of samples for lots and lots of chemistry. Um, and there's our group. And you'll see a lot of women in there. Things have changed a whole lot. Here's an example of the kind of data we collect. Uh, this is very, very traditional data. This is from the Ross Sea north of Tahiti temperature section. There's a big ridge that's a big feature that the circumpolar current tracks on. You can see warm, red warm water at the surface, cold blue water at the bottom, uh, very cold water in the Ross Sea. And what we can do with this very accurate measurements is compare them with every um, occupation before and show that there are temperature changes. I won't go through all that with you, but you can see the temperature changes in the distribution of them, especially this bottom water in the Ross Sea has been warming measurably even in the last three years. Um, you can also look at lots of chemistry. I'm showing oxygen as an example. Um, you can see features that track with the circumpolar current. The eddies are there. That's this sort of bumpy stuff. Uh, but this basic structure is there every time we measure, and then we can compare what happens year in and year out. Um, we're also making measurements now from this program um, of uh, new tracers. This is um, sulfur hex hexafluoride. Um, this is um, measured as part of the CFC suite of measurements. This shows you where water was in contact with the atmosphere not too many years ago. So you see a big blank where there's older water, and then uh, where there's color, there's newer water. So here's some bottom waters in the Ross Sea. Here's the thermocline, the upper ocean in the South Pacific, um, and then a very squeaky thin layer here in the Ross Sea that's, that's um, exposed to the atmosphere. And then you can make um, lots of different choices on how to calculate where anthropogenic carbon is in here. This is the carbon from the atmosphere that makes its way into the ocean. This is one particular type of calculation. Uh, but I just think it's a nice pattern. You see it actually kind of looks a lot like this tracer. Uh, that's not <laughs> coincidental. Um, um, but there it is sitting in the upper ocean. Uh, this is where most of the exchange with the atmosphere is. But you can see some down there in the bottom of the Ross Sea. 
so you can find out where um, things are going into the ocean. That's important for understanding how the climate is going to change or is changing already. So that's just an example of the large-scale stuff we do. I, there's tons and tons of examples. The other thing we did on that cruise, which was, is new, and I'm, I'm going to be moving into this with some new funding that's just arrived um, this week, um, is to uh, build on the Argo program, which is this extremely um, successful global profiling float program, um, and expand it to a biogeochemical program. Uh, this is with a team headed by uh, Jorge Sarmiento at Princeton and um, Ken Johnson at Embari, who's developed a pH sensor and nitrate sensors, and um, um, Steve Reiser, who will be supplying floats, and then we have a large modeling component. Um, I want to point out that the, the, there's a picture of the float, and a lot of we got, we got dispensation to sign it, so everybody on the ship piled on and put their graffiti on it. <laughs> um, and this is the... Um, this is the emergency stop button. <laughs> um, um, this technology was based, is invented here. A lot of very important technology came from the labs here. This is Russ Davis uh, in the 1990s as part of WOS, and that's what transitioned into the Argo program. Uh, Dean Rembick is extremely influential in getting that to, to go, a, a major vision um, to put this project out there um, in the global ocean, measuring um, the upper 2,000 meters. Um, so the picture, actually, that really Ken Johnson has by developing these sensors is that this is the time to go and start measuring all the other stuff that we can do with autonomous sensors. Um, and so this is what we deployed also from that cruise. Came down from Hobart, and this, and the, and those, this is where we put some floats in. Each color is a different kind of float. And um, the program will be called the Southern Ocean Climate and Carbon Observations and Modeling. Um, it involves a bunch of people here and across the country, especially Princeton, um, and UW, and this is our vision. Uh, it's kind of a sparse array for the Southern Ocean, but we'll be covering it, and they'll be sampling um, frequently. And here's some pH profiles. This is first ever off kind of type of data from the Southern Ocean. Um, this is a slide from Ken Johnson uh, showing pH on the floats that we deployed um, south of the polar front, north of the polar front, um, and the number of profiles that we cal collected in one month south of 40 south was more than had been collected in 30 years uh, in that month. This is really important because the southern ocean is one of the areas that's acidifying faster than other areas. Breakthroughs. Um, global circulation, southern ocean. Um, we know where the water goes. I'm going to segue, jump, jump fast, away from how I, what I measured to what I think I like to look at. Um, global ocean circulation. You've probably all heard about conveyor belts. I'll show you. There's the conveyor belt. This actually came out after my career got started. So 1987, broker conveyor belt. Lovely thing about this diagram is it shows the connectivity of the world, that all these oceans are connected. Um, it's not, it's kind of, it's an awfully schematic version of that. But if we go back, um, what we could say about the world ocean is we know pretty well where the water sinks, because it sinks in local places where it gets dense enough. Um, but figuring out where it comes back up again has been a long uh, chore. And probably 20 years ago, he would have said, well, I really don't know. And the, and the, and, and the idea from, of Walter and, um, and Hank Stommel and so forth in the 50s just say, well, it's coming up everywhere. Um, what we know now is that the Southern Ocean is extremely important for where water comes up. Palachesi, who's here, maybe someplace, um, has been working a lot on modeling. There she is back there. Um, that. Um, we know that this region is critical for very specifically well understood dynamical reasons. Um, so this was the conveyor belt that um, Wally Broker brought us. He knew there was a southern ocean, but he wanted to simplify something for a magazine. Uh, and there we got it. We got stuck with this picture. Um, and then um, I, I kind of stick my students with this one, which is... <laughs> <laughs> They need to be, this is the quiz at the end of the course, <laughs> but, but not at the end of the lecture. <laughs> I guess the course is at the different depths. Of the yes, the colors are different depths, right. So there's sinking in the North Atlantic. Um, the most important addition to this for the purpose of this talk is that there's a Southern Ocean component to sinking. And you'd expect that, it's cold down here. It's cold up there, it's cold down there. Water sinks where it's cold. Um, so although it doesn't sink very well in this cold spot, that's because it's too fresh. 
Um, anyway, there's lots of, lots of intricacy here, but here's the Southern Ocean, and it connects the world because it's this, it is a racetrack around Antarctica um, because there's this open passage between South America and Antarctica. Uh, that makes all the difference for the dynamics of the Southern Hemisphere compared with the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it means that water here is forced to cross deep and rise farther south to the surface and then come back. It's very difficult for warm water to make its way south across this gap. In the north, the warm water can go wherever it wants. What we need is a boundary to do that. Down here, there's no boundary. That's the difference. Of course, we know the ocean is much more complicated. Here's a result from um, uh, a one-six degree model, um, but I'm, I'll skip over that. <laughs> We're going to go back to even more simple. Uh, this is a, a way that people often look at the Southern Ocean. Um, they pretend that the whole thing looks the same everywhere, and that if you do a cross section from Antarctica north, uh, basically up to South America, but anywhere around Antarctica, you'll get this picture. And the picture is that you have deep waters coming in deep um, and rising to the surface, splitting some of them going to the north, and some of them coming back to the continent and getting even colder and sinking. So basically, your inflow is pretty deep and pretty cold. It gets colder to go to the bottom, and it has to warm up to go to the north. Uh, and the circumpolar current runs through that. Um, lots and lots of detail one could go into on that. I just want to point out that the real Real picture is at least three-dimensional and not just uh, that zonal average. This is a picture of, of temperature on a surface that it's a, it's a density surface, constant density surface that rises up to the, um, uh, up around Antarctica, close to the surface. You can't see the depth of this deep here. And then you see this warm water spiraling around and coming on in um, towards, an towards Antarctica. Where it comes closest, and then it actually spreads on into the Ross Sea here. Where it does that is where there's an awful lot of changes in ice sheet mass balances. This is a picture uh, from Mignot et al. showing how the Antarctic ice sheet changes. There's a lot of implication of these warm waters in the ice shelf, um, how the ice shelves come off and how they melt and break off. And that's a balance that's always there, but if you bring in more warm water, you're going to break off more ice. So it's part of the story of what's happening with the ice sheet. So that's kind of a, you know, just a whiz through the, the Southern Ocean. Uh, this is an iceberg from um, uh, one, of the, one of the talented photographers. We had many talented photographers on that cruise. Uh, not too much to look at. We didn't have polar, no polar bears in the Southern Ocean. <clears throat> uh, no penguins, no sea life. We had icebergs. OK, the other thing I want to just go through quickly is the climate change. This is the other big thing that is part of my what I've been working on, um, not my own work, but I've been part of the IPCC process for the last two rounds, as have many of you. Um, and uh, points here um, are that global warming is ocean warming. Um, and there, it, the heat is not missing. This thing called the hiatus is um, a surface temperature phenomenon. Um, this is not new information. This is, um, this is information that was easy to diagnose and put in this report. Not, not so easy. Dean Remick was part of this and Greg Johnson. They, they put this together. Um, second, the ocean functions as a gigantic rain gauge. It's 70% of the Earth's surface. It's where most of the raining and evaporate, it's where the evaporate, most of the water comes from that's going into the atmosphere. Um, as it rains, it freshens. As it evaporates, it gets saltier. So if you rain more and evaporate less, it'll get fresher. And if you do the opposite, it'll get saltier. So by measuring the surface salinity and upper ocean salinity, we can see um, how the hydrological cycle is changing. So the ocean is a big rain gauge. And the third point here is that the ocean, uh, because of the excess, um, the anthropogenic CO2, which is excess, and part of that gets into the ocean, the ocean is acidifying. And you've already seen this plot, so I don't need to spend much time at all on it. Here's the temp surface temperature. Here's the hiatus. That's the surface temperature record up through 2000 comes up plateaus. Uh-oh. Let's say there's no such thing as global warming. Um, OK. <laughs> and we do see, as, as Walter pointed out, that there are bumps and wiggles here. Um, we can also map out um, where the surface temperature change is concentrated. It's mostly over land. 
But where is the heat change? Um, this is what we've documented in the ocean observations chapter in the IPCC. This is the upper ocean, the top 700 meters. This is the trend from 1971 to, to basically the present of the report. Um, and that's because the data sets weren't that good enough before that. So Greg refused to make the calculation before that. It's mapped out very nicely. You see most of the, war ocean, most of the world is warming, but there are areas that warm more. There they are. And areas that actually cool. And these are interesting patterns. Lots of interesting science in this, in this map. Um, if you look at this as a function of latitude, you'll see the warming extending to depth in the north. That's the North Atlantic. Um, where else is the ocean warm? Oh, and here was an important number. 77% of the extra energy in the Earth climate system that's due to climate change is in this layer. That's a lot. Okay, the deep ocean, this is a, a picture based on our hydrographic sections that we've taken for all these years. Um, warming is concentrated in the, in the southern ocean. That's where our closest window to the, to the surface is and the water spreads out. Um, or there's less of it being formed or something is happening. That's a, that's a, a, a work in progress for the community. Um, what we can document is that 16% of the extra energy is in this deep ocean layer below 4,000 meters. So what we see is that most of the deep ocean is warming and the warming is, is, is concentrated in the southern ocean. <coughs> when we plot um, heat content of all the parts of the climate system um, here since the 1970 up to the present, um, let's see, atmosphere is this little teeny bumpy thing down here. Air doesn't have whole much heat. Um, it's a gas. Then we have the land. It actually holds a little more because there's water in the soil. Um, ice has water in it too. Uh, here's the deep ocean. Here's the upper ocean. So you see that almost all of the excess heat is in the ocean, 93% of it. That's not true for the carbon um, that, that goes into the atmosphere. The ocean does not suck up 93%. It's way less. But of the heat, it's going in the ocean. If you, you yeah. So why don't you give this in terms of joules per cubic meter for every region? These are integrated because, because we want to be able to talk about this curve too, which is a global average. Uh, and also there's a lot more uncertainty. You, you, you crunch down the uncertainty when you do average over bigger areas. Pardon me? There has to be large fluctuations. There are, yes. So, so you integrate over big areas um, and you get Here's the uncertainty bars. That's the dashes out here, the dash lines. Um, if you took all this heat and put it in the atmosphere, we'd be at 100 degrees warmer. So <laughs> that's a nice fact to take home to the family. <laughs> um, and we also see no hiatus in this curve. Now, I have to say that Greg picked his favorite curve from Dominguez et al., which isn't even cited in some of these recent papers on hiatus. Um, but the other ones may have a little twist at the end or not. And the uncertainty, uncertainty range is, is pretty large. Um, we don't see much happening in um, ocean heat content. Um, so the ocean is holding most of the heat. And it is important that the atmosphere, um, that we know what the atmosphere is doing, because that's where we live. But it's not where the heat is. <laughs> OK. And this is the recent paper that was just alluded to, uh, Chen and Tung last week in Science. Um, and they've plotted. Um, all these things, and you can see in different areas of the world, here's the global ocean, different layers. Uh, there's a rise all the way to the end. No hiatus in the ocean. And they attach that to a rise in the Atlantic back here around 2000, and then a rise in the Southern Ocean later on. So it, they've got the regional dependence. There is a lot of work on that. The ocean has a rain gauge. Um, this is a plot also from this IPCC chapter. Um, I did this late at night with my own Adobe Illustrator package. <laughs> um, the map to focus on is at the bottom. This is the surface salinity of the world ocean. And the one above it is the trend in surface salinity of the world ocean since 1950 up to 2000. Um, there's some similarity between these two maps. And what we can conclude from them is that the um, salty areas are getting saltier, roughly, and the fresh areas are getting fresher roughly, not one-to-one -one correspondence everywhere, but enough. Um, 
And the contrast between salty and fresh has been growing, and that's statistically robust. Uh, this is consistent with a warmer atmosphere that is more humid, more moisture in the atmosphere. The atmosphere doesn't hold much water compared with the ocean. <laughs> um, so you, you have an infinite supply of water for the atmosphere. If the atmosphere wants to hold more, it can get it. And when it holds more, it's in its, it's in its own equilibrium, which means it's cranking it through. So it's going to be picking it up in one place and putting it down somewhere else. Um, the exact scaling of that to the exact warming that we know has happened in the atmosphere is also an area of research. But this general idea of um, this salinity changes showing this consistency uh, means that we can also see climate change going on in the hydrological cycle. That's important for starting to understand drought and flooding on land. I think this is my last slide uh, from this IPCC chapter. Um, it's possible now to plot, um, to map, uh, the global anthropogenic carbon inventory. There are different versions of this. This is the one that um, was chosen. Um, and you see um, where it's, there's color, is where the anthropogenic carbon, so burning fossil fuels, putting in the atmosphere um, to reach equilibrium with the ocean, some of that goes in. That's, you're going to hear a lot about that tomorrow, I hope, because I'm not the one to explain the carbon cycle to you. Ralph will do that, maybe, <laughs> or Mark, or somebody, tomorrow. Um, anyway, here's a map uh, from Kadiwala et al. Um, and you see most of it in the, in the North Atlantic. This is deep convection. Actually, this is going all the way back to my first year work as a graduate student with Mike McCartney on the Labrador Sea. Um, and then a big band um, in the Southern Ocean, which is not exactly the circumpolar current, but it's, it's got a lot of interesting features to it, you know, why it's that way it is. And then there's a lot of it going into the Arctic. Um, time series at Hawaii, there are very few time series to back this up. Very, very few. Here's one. At Hawaii, uh, because of the IGY and Dave Keeling um, and persistence over decades of maintaining this and continuing persistence, thank you, um, the atmospheric uh, CO2 going up, surface ocean PCO2, basically the carbon in the surface ocean going up, and the pH going down. Uh, this is measured since 1990. Um, there are lots of projections of how pH will go. Um, some regions that are really going to acidify faster and that are, are the northern North Pacific, this coastal region here, and the southern ocean. So that's pretty much it for plots. Um, it was, I just want to say that it was an incredible pleasure being part of this process. I don't actually work on climate myself for research. I work on the large scale circulation. But it was really um, important to be part of pulling all these things together. And Greg Johnson, um, kind of as he was going along, let loose this haiku for our chapter, <laughs> which was lovely. And then he showed up with a little tiny book, and he'd done a watercolor uh, for our chapter. And then it turned out he did one for every single chapter. So I highly recommend looking this up. Um, this was for our chapter, and uh, Abyss Warms. I've shown you that. The Coast's Flood. I didn't talk about sea level. Air moistens, salt patterns shift, and carbon sours oceans. Where do we go? <laughs> this, is a, this is one of the ways we're doing measurements in the Southern Ocean, very creatively. <laughs> um, forward. We need data to figure out what's going on. The observing system breakthrough, so this is the third breakthrough, I was only supposed to have two, is the Argo Profiling Network. Uh, for, for the interior of the ocean. Satellites are, are an absolute essential big breakthrough also for these decades. Um, but within the ocean, this, is, this has made all the difference. Our students don't know that oceanography existed before Argo, <laughs> which is great. It's a wonderful data set. And then there's these creative solutions. Uh, so this shows um, in the Southern Ocean where all the Argo data were for um, about a year. Here's an Argo float sitting at the surface after it's come up to talk. Um, you see big gaps here. Oh, why are there gaps? Oh, there's sea ice. It's hard to measure down there. Um, and um, so these pinnipeds, this is the pinniped network, um, um, have been going around with their CTDs on their foreheads, <laughs> helping us. <laughs> and they dive deep and make lots of profiles. This is actually a very important data set. Um, one would hope to be able to eventually fill this all in, and we can. Um, 
We have a way to do upper ocean Argo now under the sea ice. Uh, we cannot track without more money. We need a lot more money to be able to insonify and listen and track, track floats under there. Basically now we just put them down and they come up at the end of the next, next summer, into the summer. And we can now start to monitor the carbon cycle and ocean productivity, uh, move towards a bio-Argo. The deep ocean is not covered with Argo. D Argo goes to 2,000 meters, and I think that's just a, a design decision. And so now, as of this year, there's testing of Argo to the bottom, uh, and that's going to start in um, several different basins. Um, first, I think off of here, the experiment was out just recently, just put, put the floats down. These will go to the bottom. They're more expensive, and they need more battery power but it'll start allowing us to say something about deep ocean heat and temperature content. So back to the take home messages. Um, first of all, for science, when you look at every observed record, for instance, that surface temperature record, um, there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. Um, you see what you see. And including the controversies, they can lead you down some really fun paths of discovery. And the hiatus is one such place. People are really looking hard at how the ocean works. Um, and how the atmosphere works top down. You know, what's the reason for this feature in uh, the surface temperature? Um, if you bat so this is, this is the fun part of the science, um, the fun part of being an observer. Um, the big picture um, coming from all of this work that everyone has been doing and all the measurements making is that there's unequivocal warming. Um, even though there's natural variability, hydrological balance is shifting. The oceans are acidifying. Ice sheets are starting to break up, I didn't talk about that, and there is sea level rise. And we need sustained observations to keep that going. So I'm going to finish with one more Greg Johnson haiku. <laughs> um, this was from one of the later chapters in the IPCC. 40 years from now, children will live in a world shaped by our choices. So thanks. <laughs>
Uh, I have a somewhat different question. I don't know whether you would be able to answer. Uh, in uh, uh, research on some tests going on with uh, carbon sequestration to help uh, coal industry, what oceanographers are thinking about scenario of dumping carbon to the ocean floor? Maybe somebody else should answer that because I, you know, I hear about it, but uh, who? Oh, Ralph knows the answer. Yes. <laughs> One of our speakers from Toronto. Did you want to take that up, Ralph? I can say it. Ralph Keeling. I mean, the idea of pumping carbon in the deep ocean was advanced probably a few decades ago, and it's mostly run afoul of the concern that it would affect organisms in the deep ocean which on the face of it is a little strange because pumping it in the atmosphere affects the whole planet. <laughs> but we have a law of the sea, and so we have international treaties to protect the deep ocean. We don't have something similar to protect the planet as a whole. So that's where it's small. And of course, there's some continued discussion about pumping it into the below ground in places near power plants or elsewhere. So that was just addressing that, that. That is still sort of on the research agenda. It just doesn't have a mechanism to pay for it. Margaret? Uh, with the El Nino, El Nino, La Nina cycle, do you anticipate that the hiatus will terminate and that will, and when, how soon? Um, well, El Nino, it's more, it, this is more the decadal scale of the El Nino, La Nina. Um, so that you're talking, El Nino is a five to seven, three, five, seven year cycle, um, but that's modulated over a sort of a decadal time scale. And I guess that's what's implicated here. This new paper last week says, let's look at the North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean instead as the places where the heat has really been taken up. Um, and I would agree with that idea also to look there. Um, and that's again a decadal, that's what you're seeing is a natural variability. It's either the El Nino La Nina cycle over here, or there's a big decadal variability in the North Atlantic called the North Atlantic Oscillation um, that swamps anything that we can measure for trends in the Northern North Atlantic. Um, the Southern Ocean has another big mode. These are natural modes of, um, of the coupled climate system. And so they have their own sort of chaotic, you know, it's a very broad spectrum, but with a peak someplace around 10, 20, 30 years. So that uh, it's possible that the hiatus will continue well, for a decade? Well, we're away before. I, I think, yeah, I, <laughs> yes. it, nothing is forever. Um, <laughs> I'll jump in on this one. It, this is going to be a matter of active controversy for the next couple of years. But the basic point is there are only a few places in the ocean where you can force warm water down into the depths. And uh, the, there's the Antarctic, there's the formation of the North Atlantic deep water, and the Western Pacific, which is the destination of the El Nino waters that are blown across the Pacific, La Nina waters, which are blown across the Pacific by the trade winds. The Western Pacific is as hot and as elevated as it has been in years. And NOAA started off by predicting that there would be a large uh, El Nino uh, relaxation of the system where all the hot water that's piling up can't all go underneath, and so it'll flow back across the Pacific. The one difference, the one reason I am suspicious of their prediction at the moment is that there's another paper out that shows that the trade winds which drive the La Nina cycle, the trade wind stress is two to three times larger in the forcing sense, subduction forcing sense, than it has than its historical average. And so if their predictions are based on empirical experience, they may be wrong. The trade winds may, in fact, uh, I don't know. I'm not going to make a prediction, but the one thing that's different about this prediction as opposed to the one 15 years ago is the strength of the trade winds. I guess I'd put it that way. So I have Jeff, then, I, then, then Lynn has to leave, and I'm going to make a remark, and then we're all going to go for, for food. Yeah. Is yeah. there somebody else? Walter, are you also? Yeah. OK. okay so. Um, <clears throat> the use of the ocean as a as a rain gauge. The I guess the question is if we were to if you're to integrate a, a really interesting number is if is the global integral of the precipitation on the ocean 
minus the evaporation, because that number has to be also the runoff from the land. That's correct. And, and I guess the question is, um, have, have you, how robust do you think this measurement of precipitation by salinity is, and, and what sort of numbers are you getting if you do that global integral? The global integral, so this is interesting. The first, the, the IPCC was on the, the, was on the AR4 as well. Sid Levitas was part of our team. He came in with salinity trend maps. This is before there's Argo data, so you could still see it in the historical data. And he was showing salinity trends from Tim Boyer at NODC. And, um, and uh, we said, is there any signal there? He said, no, it all integrates to zero. There's no signal to talk about. Oh, but if you look at each ocean, the Pacific is freshening. The Atlantic is getting saltier. So you're getting a redistribution. That's the normal distribution. The, North Atl the Atlantic is a salty ocean. The Pacific is fresh. The Indian is salty. And normally, water is picked up from the evaporative basins and put in the fresh basin. And what was happening was that that, was, that has gotten stronger. That's a zonal redistribution of well, but, but some water. But goes onto the land and then goes into the ocean. Uh, it's tiny. I, it's not tiny, but it's not. It's, it integrates out. Um, the only way you'll see a mean change in the salinity is from um, introduction of new fresh water, I think, from basically from melting. Which was big Which in the past and not so big yet now. Very big in the past, not big enough to detect now. Yeah. Yeah. So, Lynn, I'm going to let you go. Thank you. And uh, I, I'm. Thank you. Uh, she. Yeah, okay, right. And so now we'll take some more questions until you all get tired. And I go ahead. Um, this is again slightly off in a bit of a tangent, but uh, there's been a lot of publicity recently about plastics in the ocean and getting into the food chain and so on. Um, this is obviously not directly connected with temperature and salinity and so on, but how seriously do you think uh, that that is, quant you know, quantitatively now? Uh, do we have a marine ecologist here that could, how, how if you, we, what we know is that the plastics that we all put into the ocean are convected towards the center of the Pacific and get trapped in a gyre in the middle of the Pacific. And it's not plastic bags that you see floating on the top of the ocean in the middle of the Pacific. By that time, the sun has uh, broken up all these plastic bags into little pieces that fish eat. So they're actually more dangerous, and you can't, and it's unretrievable, basically. So the question is quantitatively, how big a quantitative threat is that to the uh, the living biota in the in the Pacific Ocean, and I don't know the quantitative answer to that question. Does somebody know it? We're, we're going to have marine ecology tomorrow. Uh, uh, Vic, yeah, Vic, maybe you can uh, ask somebody around and see if we can get an answer to that one. You want me to take a crack? Yeah, if you're ready, Richard. Richard Norris. Uh, oh, there's actually a microphone. Um, Oh, okay, that's good. Hold I, it up. I, I have to, Hold I, it I up. I don't like this. No, I think, um, well, so there was just recently the uh, an Algalita expedition to the so-called Pacific Garbage Patch. Whoops, that? Hold it up. It does work, does it? No. No, okay. <laughs> yes, I was trying to boom out, okay? Uh, yeah, anyway, and they found a lot of tsunami debris, as it turns out, uh, from the uh, Japanese tsunami three years ago. Um, and so there is actually floating material out there. Charlie's right that most of it is really small material uh, that is confined principally to the surface ocean. Um, but it is being taken up by fish, uh, and, there, and actually Scripps uh, research uh, during the Seaplex expedition showed that midwater fishes are eating this plastic, and they in turn then get eaten by other organisms too. But I think we don't really know what the actual impact is in terms of the food chain. It's, a, it's probably a bit premature to, to say that there's a, a really severe negative impact of that. There has been studies out in, the, actually in the California coastal waters based upon Cal Coffee studies. Uh, and it's very clear that the plastic issue is a post-1970 thing. Okay, since the 1970s, we see more and more plastic uh, in coastal waters. And the vast majority of what is in the deep ocean uh, is from, from land-based sources. And I think that's all I should say. Well, thank you.
Okay, I'm about ready to call the question, but I'm going to issue a challenge uh, to the people that um, I heard today, uh, not to answer this question today, but to do so tomorrow, because my talk will also be on the implications of the hiatus. And in particular, uh, David Victor and I have submitted a paper to Nature, which suggests that the two degree surface temperature goal that the climate negotiators are working on is meaningless. And that uh, they're all negotiating for the wrong thing. And this will not be popular. Um, but we also suggest that there are two more fundamental measures uh, of the actual impact that humans are making on the climate. One is ocean heat content, and the other is something that Francisco wanted to measure, which is the radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere. And both of these are more fundamental measures of the energy going into the climate system, which then redistributes it in incredibly complicated ways. And so what we want to suggest uh, is that, uh, that we have a technical conference that reviews the readiness of these two measurements to become uh, uh, indicators uh, for the global climate negotiations. And so, and I, it's a technical issue. I don't know how ready they are, and, but people here at Scripps and others do know the answer to that question, and you can, we can have a discussion about that tomorrow. But today, we have a reception that uh, I presume they're out there. The, the door's been closed. Or the, the food is there. So let's all go and uh, thank you. This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Now, um, you all are going to have exactly the same feeling that a lot of other people have said when they asked, what in the world is the astro an astrophysicist doing chairing a session on oceanography? <laughs> and the answer is um, that Wolf Berger, who was scheduled to do this, was unable to make it. So we self-organized at the last minute, and I'm your chairman which is why I'm here, and that's the only logical explanation I can offer. So, uh, and then uh, at the last, and so we have a self-organized session, and the only thing I know is the order of the speakers, and I know two of their three topics. Um, Walter Monk, who will go first, I asked him what he was going to say, and he said it's a secret. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, he's earned the privilege. And uh, so then next is John Orkut, with whom I worked exceptionally closely when uh, he and I were in. Please let me discuss a table, which I think is very interesting, based on, 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 on the, the Dean Ramick's data. On the left column are heat content uh, at various depths. In joule, and the change, I'm sorry, change in heat content in joules per year. And in the last 10 years, from zero to 500 meters, three times 10 to the 21st, and almost the same amount from 500 to 2,000 meters. That's an enormous change, isn't it, Charlie? in the point of view that people have taken. You cannot interpret the unbalance in radiation without looking at not only at the surface layer of the ocean, but you have to now go down to 2,000 meters. And maybe essentially we have to go deeper. And those numbers are very encouraging. 
six times 10 to the 21st joules per year when you ask what it demands for the unbalance you get roughly 0.55 watts per meter square, which is a very respectable number in terms of what we know. It corresponds to certain numbers of degrees per year. And uh, if you calculate the total thermal expansion here was continuing its unstoppable continuous increase that it has done since the turn of the century. And people who would like to find a fault with the global warming point of view could point to that and say, you see, there, are the, there has been no warming for 10 years, and CO2 has gone up. What's going on? And uh, Charlie has written a very detailed paper on that subject which is being published by the, by the, Vatican, the, the American Philosophical Society and has related that to an El Nino-La Nina cycle, having looked into many possibilities. And I want to point out that I think he's absolutely right. And I will show you slide two, which I was permitted to show by uh, courtesy of Dean Rummick and John Church from Australia. Uh, and it goes back to something that was discussed earlier this morning, Argo floats. You know there are now 35, 3,600 Argo floats. You've seen a few pictures of how they're in the director's office together, and he's going to talk about the Arctic, which will be a nice lead in to one of the talks uh, that we will have in my session uh, next uh, to tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's coming up. Uh, I, I think my talk is prepared, I'm not sure, but I, and then finally, Lynn Talley uh, is going to talk about uh, ocean circulation and the, and the real topic of this uh, session, which is the oceans. So with that, Walter, I'm as uh, eager to hear what uh, this classified topic is uh, as, uh, as everybody else. You will soon see why I wouldn't reply to Charlie. You see here, my first slide, and everyone else so far has started by complimenting Charlie what a great job he did in various aspects. My first slide was stolen from Charlie from something he spoke about a few months ago at the Vatican. That is a slide that Charlie showed on his most recent work on the hiatus of global warming. And you see there are two periods one around starting around 1960 and another one starting very recently, about 2005 or so, where the temperature of the atmosphere and of the surface water did not change at a time when the CO2 content of the atmosphere distributed over the world's ocean. They go down to 2,000 meters and then stay there for 10 days, then go up to the surface and give the information of what they measure on the way down and on the way up to some satellites. A hugely successful undertaking. And this is a unpublished slide of what they have observed to 2,000 meters. And it shows that in that deeper column, the heat content, which is the proper variable, not the surface temperature, but the heat content, has in fact increased over this period, even though surface temperature, as you can see, remained relatively constant. And it looks on that slide as if this year will in fact be the end of constant surface temperatures as well, and it's in complete support that there is a 
warming of the heat content of the planet Earth. And the interesting thing is that it is now going deeper to 2,000 meters. And the reason for it going deeper has to do, in fact, with the El Nino-La Nina circulation, which Charlie discussed. 